As some of you know, what seems like a political lifetime ago, uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden launched really a multi-pronged uh, attack, if you will, on cancer. Uh, and um, that is something that all of us who toil in this field are grateful for beyond words. And we've already been able to see a lot of the good outcome of that. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, Harold Freeman yesterday showed us a picture of uh, President Nixon signing the Cancer Act in 1971, which actually was something that got me interested in the field. I was a medical student at the time. Um, I think we're going to look back um, on what happened um, with uh, the moonshot and with the Biden Cancer Initiative as another turning point uh, in our fight against cancer. Uh, and um, when Vice President Biden formed the Biden Cancer Initiative, he looked around for an executive director, and we think he found uh, the perfect one. Uh, and he's not only been working hard to make that an effective process, but has been a terrific spokesperson for what we all believe. So without further ado, because uh, really, you want to hear from Greg and not me. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule uh, to be with us today. And I know this is a topic that uh, is important to you and to the Vice President. Good morning, everybody. Now, let me get this straight. I usually start my talks by asking why there's not more diversity in the audience. If, could I take this audience with me and take the 90% of you who are women with me to the meetings I go to that are all men? Uh, I just was on a panel last week uh, talking about cancer drug development to an intellectual property group. It was all white men on the stage. It was mainly white men in the audience. Can I bring you with me next time? Uh, we, we at the Biden Cancer Initiative and at the Moonshot want everything we do to look like America. Uh, and uh, we need you in a lot more places. But thank you for what you do. I can divide my world into audiences that know empathy and audiences that don't. And um, audiences that have trust and audiences that don't. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a biorepository meeting in Europe. And earlier I had talked to a meeting about CRISPR. And I asked everybody in the audience, Put your phone in your right hand and hand it to the person behind you for the rest of my talk. And they wouldn't do it. <laughs> and I said, let me get this straight. You don't trust the person behind you with your phone for 30 minutes because you're afraid they're going to spy on you, screw it up, call your mother, whatever. <laughs> and the person in front of you doesn't trust you. But you want patients to trust you with their biopsy tissue or their gene pool because you say that it, you'll be fine, don't worry. Well, if you won't loan your phone for 30 minutes, why should patients loan you anything? The one group that did it without one murmur was a nursing group I spoke to at a, <laughs> at a leukemia meeting. They all just handed the phones right back. And I said, that's because people trust you and you trust people. So thank you for what you do. I, I uh, uh, have been on a tear that we're going to have a system in this country for navigating self-driving cars before we have a system for patient navigation. And what the hell is that about? Um, they both will save lives, but you will save a whole lot more. So a couple stories about my personal uh, journey with patients' world. When my first child was born in 1989, he had some meconium in the, flu in the amniotic fluid, and so he had to be watched, a little breathing tick, for four hours in the ICU. Seven o'clock at night when he went in. Four hours later, I show up to get my baby out of the box. And the nurse said, oh, well, the nurse who checked him in has already left. You can just leave him here. We'll bring him to you in the morning. I said, no, no, no. That's not going to work. First, my wife really needs to feed this baby. And secondly, he's not going to start his life on earth in a box. 
for longer than he already has. So they said, okay, well, we have to redo the paperwork. I said, I'll wait. So they did the paperwork, and of course, they have to take the baby to the nursery. So they take the baby to the nursery. It's Labor Day also. So people are on, you know, we're, we're not... We're not getting necessarily the A-team. It's Labor Day, people, vacations, et cetera. We go to the nursery, and everybody says, let your wife sleep. We'll, we'll keep the baby. We'll bring, him in, we'll bring him to you in the morning. Now, we're old-fashioned parents. We didn't want them to give him sugar water. We had a birth plan. We had all of this stuff that millennials find quaint. And um, <laughs> that's what they get for having a natural childbirth is they, they, don't, they don't pay attention to it. Um, so we said... No, I really, my wife is ready to pop. She needs to feed this baby. So we'll take the baby. Don't worry about our sleep. That's done. We're, we know that's done. So finally we got the baby like two hours later because I made them give us the baby. Now, fast forward to my dad. Uh, my dad had been hooked on Valium by his country doctor because it was an easy way to get this older guy out of his office who complained of nerves and itching in his legs. And my sister and I got him off of Valium, got him onto Tylenol, and then when we weren't there, he went back to his doctor one time and he put him back on Valium. So he ends up in the hospital for an unrelated thing. I think it was a urinary tract thing. And the hospital, not knowing he was addicted to Valium, put him on Demerol. Well, Demerol and Valium together make you crazy. And the hospital called me and said, you need to come down. Your dad's trying to walk home through the hospital wall of his room. So I end up uh, babysitting my dad for the next several days to keep him from literally trying to walk through the wall to go to the kitchen. And the hospital had never figured out that the Demerol was the problem. But when they, when they finished with the reason he was in the hospital, they said, he can't stay here. He's done. I said, but he's not even sane right now. They said, that's not our problem. Um, you have to move him somewhere. He couldn't come home because we didn't have the ability to handle him at home. And just so happened there was a nursing home next to the hospital. I was literally weeping in the hospital lobby about how I was going to take care of my dad even to get him next door because he was a strong man and he was delusional at that moment. Well, we got him to the nursing home and a miracle happened. He was refusing to eat. He was not going to the bathroom. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And then a friend of my father's and my mother's who had had a store across the street from our store on Main Street in Blyville, Arkansas, who had become a nurse in her 70s, showed up and looked at me and looked at my father totally by chance and said, Mike Simon, my dad, what the hell are you doing here? He snapped out of it, and within 12 hours, she had all his systems on go, and we were able to bring him home because her whole job was to walk the halls of the nursing home and fix problems. And here she had seen someone she had known for 50 years that she knew was otherwise a robust person it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life at that point was to have that one person who knew what she was doing say, what the hell are you doing here? We're going to get you out of here. And she did. So then my dad was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 91. And at back then in 2001, and sadly, even today, it's who you know. So I called Al Rabson, the angel of the National Cancer Institute, the deputy director who was married to Ruth Kirstein, and um, they were a terrific couple. And Al looked at my dad's x-rays and said, you're not going to save his life. Don't let him. And, and the thing is, in my hometown, you could only get cancer on Tuesdays and Thursdays because that's when doctors came over from Memphis. And one was a chemotherapist and one was a radiologist, and they wanted him to do both. And Al Rapson said, Greg, don't give him chemo. Give him radiation to keep his lung clear because that's where the tumor was. It could cause pneumonia. But he's going to just need palliative care. You're not going to save him. I said, great. And then something wonderful happened. Now think about all these other experiences I've had where nothing wonderful happened until something awful happened. My hometown of Blyville, Arkansas, had a hospice program in their local hospital that came to our house and made my dad's last two weeks a blessing and not a curse. Helped us understand what was going to happen. 
be able to predict to us when he would go into a coma and literally when he was going to die, which made everything so much more natural for us. And we were able to, as a family, not be constantly surprised by what is next. We made a donation to that hospice after my father passed. It was the first time they'd ever gotten a donation. Think about that. It was the first time they'd ever gotten a donation. This is an impoverished county. And yet they had provided the best service that my father had ever gotten. So why do I tell you all that? Today, 2017, you would think we're much farther along than all that, right? But I know from my personal experience when I went through chemotherapy that even I, who know a lot about this field, was pretty befuddled and perplexed when the doctor said, you know what, we're going to start your chemo tomorrow. I was thinking next month after my August vacation. He said, no, we're starting it tomorrow. And I showed up after a year of going to the hospital for checkups for my leukemia, having no clue what was going to happen next. And what happened next was they put me in a chair and they hooked me up and the nurse starts putting on protective gear. Not on me, on her. And I'm like, whoa, I'm the one you're more likely to spill it on and I'm the one who's getting it in my bloodstream. And nobody ever said, here's why I'm putting on the protective gear, because I do this 20 times a day, and a little spill goes a long way. So from that moment on, and then the inpatient and all of that, I had no idea what was going to happen next. But I did know this, don't ever be alone. And I was never alone. I had friends and family with me pretty much all the time. My baby son was never alone, because if he had been, he'd have spent 12 hours in a box. So I say all this because I can't add to your knowledge of how to do patient navigation because you know far more about it than I do. I can't add to your enthusiasm for it because I'm sure that's already at a maximum. But I can tell you this, this has got to be a priority of our medical system. But more importantly, it has got to be a priority for our society. We are suffering a crisis of empathy. When I talk to pediatric groups, I say no group needs empathy more than people with children with cancer. And yet our system continues to punish families from the tax perspective, from the economy perspective, and we're not, and we're not even authorizing the CHIP program on time. And it's all because of a lack of empathy. So we finally have changed our system to treat doctors as caregivers, not as accountants. And we say, you know, it's not how much you do, it's how well you do what you do. And we started to change our whole payment plan for medical everything to the oncology care model and pay for performance to try to get doctors to focus on the relationship with the patient, not the how many articles you could bring into the room and use, how many tests you can order, etc. Well, now the administration says they're going to roll all that back. God help us if we have orthopedists develop a health care system. Orthopedists are the highest paid doctors, and they are, you know, sawbones. As the joke is, you have to be strong as an ox and slightly smarter to be an orthopedist. <laughs> and I say that knowing I've insulted a whole group of people. <laughs> but we need pediatricians to design our health care system. People who have empathy, people who know what it's like to know that when they save a life, they've saved decades of a life. So how does that relate to what I'm doing today? Joe Biden found out the hard way what happens when you're in the health system and you want people to work together. And the answer was they don't and they can't. He had to fly images of his son's brain cancer from Philadelphia to Houston on Air Force Two to get them shared quickly for a clinical trial that was undergoing with an N of one, his son. And right then he thought, this can't be the way everybody has to do it. And of course the answer is no, most people don't ever get to do it because they don't have an airplane. So that's what led him to be so involved and led Obama to start the cancer moonshot and now the cancer initiative. 
And we're trying to do something that's really embarrassing. We're trying to create the system that patients think we already have. Think about it. Patients assume that their doctor knows what the best treatment is for their cancer because they keep up with it, whether they're in New York or Bemidji, Minnesota. They think that their doctor would collaborate with other doctors and other hospitals if they're in a clinical trial to see if they should be in that clinical trial, and they would help them find a way to do it, and that there's a system to help them pay their expenses and watch their kids and feed their dog and watch and even pay their parking, and there's not. They assume that people who got into medicine to cure things want to share their research with other people. They assume that when something's published, you can find out all the data behind it immediately without paying thousands of dollars. None of that is true. Your medical records live and die in the house they were born in, just like my Uncle Tom. And my Uncle Tom was a world-class hoarder. He literally had every surface of his house, including the toilet, the sink, the tub, and the stove, covered with paper to the ceiling. He would go out at night and find stuff to bring home. Now, what is the difference between that and most medical research institutions? They may not put it on paper, but they're stacked to the ceiling with data that never goes anywhere. Now, what happened when my uncle died was my sainted mother used about a dozen city dumpsters to throw stuff away, but as we went through this archaeological dig, we found some pretty amazing stuff. Newspaper articles from World War II, my father's ticket home from London in the war on the Queen Mary, his gun and his bag of bullets, the Colt 45 he had issued, where he had dropped it on the floor when he came home from the war. And my mother mailed it to me. And it got to me with the bullets. <laughs> I'm not making that up. And what we found also was a broadsheet my grandfather had written to every member of Congress about why cotton subsidies could help end the Depression. And I found all the deeds for all my grandfather's property that he had bought and sold during the Depression. He named all of his kids with the same initials so he could hide property from the creditors by moving it from M.J. Simon to M.J. Simon. Now, he was a smart guy, you know, he's Lebanese immigrant. We're natural merchants, you know. And we found all this because we were finally able to dig into it. And you asked me why I care about data sharing in health. There is no difference between my Uncle Tom's house and most cancer centers. They are hoarding the data and nobody ever sees it. And if you ask for it, the first question is why? And as Joe Biden said to the head of Epic, who asked him, why do you want to see your medical records? You won't understand most of it. He said, none of your business. If I want to nail it to the wall in my kitchen, I will. But I understand more than you think I do, and I have people who can explain the rest to me, which is what most people would say. So what are we actually doing? Well, Joe Biden is not a technical expert, and Jill Biden, is not, they're not technical experts. They're not doctors. They haven't been doing this their whole lives, as you all have. But they deeply care about changing the assumptions of our healthcare system to be patient-centered, data-rich, and collaborative. So we've created working groups on data sharing, working group on data standards, because it is obscene that our cancer field does not have standard lexicons. I was at a meeting last week with the most prestigious, five of the most prestigious cancer institutions in the country. And I asked them, how many of you would trust a pathology report from another of the institutions in this room? And one person yelled out, I don't even trust them from my institution. And think about that. And it's true. So we're not giving our working group a year we're giving them three months to come back, not starting from scratch, but looking at what are the right things people are doing, which ones can we scale, and which ones are most appropriate for Joe and Jill Biden to convene a meeting with the people whose minds have to change and get them to change their mind through inspiration or shame. And Joe Biden's willing to do either one in equal measure. 
can it be done? Well, we started at the moonshot in March of 16. And people said, why would you take a job that's only nine months long? And I said, well, stop talking to my wife, number one. And number two, nine months is plenty of time to start something that can change the world. It's not enough to finish it, but it's enough to get it started. We started between 70 and 80 collaborations within the government and between the government, the private sector, and in the private sector. And the cancer support community had a meeting this past summer to go over the 70 to 80 things that were promised. And this report, which you can get on their website, Cancer Support Community, lists the status of most of those programs. And they are doing what they said they would do. Deloitte created a $10 million X Prize for innovation in cancer prevention. Several cancer centers are working together to deal with lung cancer screening in Cleveland and Washington, which have higher than average smoking rates and lung cancer rates. Bristol Myers promised 25 million from their foundation to go to survivorship. They just granted $25 million to places like the University of South Carolina Nursing School, not just Harvard and Yale, the University of Louisville, to help people survive lung cancer treatment and to help people survive and destigmatize having lung cancer. So people are willing to do, if you ask them to, some pretty amazing things. Now, last point, and I'll let you disagree with me on anything. Um, patient navigation, I know, is a phrase that's got a lot of different meanings behind it and a lot of different ways of looking at it and a lot of different ways of doing it. But my concern is very simple. We have apps now that can let you drive anywhere to anywhere without you even knowing how to read. We have people developing programs so that if you have a prostate biopsy or you have an ACL surgery, doctors have to pay people to answer the phone for 20 people who had that procedure yesterday to call every day and say, when can I have sex again? Am I supposed to be feeling this way? Why does my knee look like this? And so now they have an app where they send you every day a picture of what your knee ought to look like. And if it looks like this, just go right to the ER and I'll meet you there because you've got a major infection. Or yes, you had a prostate biopsy, and if you'll wait three days, yes, you can have sex again, but don't call us every day, here's the deal. And they give people a script, they give people a roadmap, they give them a vision of this is what happens next. Don't be so anxious, it's okay. We've done this before. And we do that in everything but cancer, and everything but serious diseases that scare people to death and kill them. This is a doable thing, but it is not being done. It is not being done so that people are, it's bad enough to have cancer, but to have fear is worse. The best advice I got when I was diagnosed was, when you get treated, do your life. Keep your life. Don't stop working. Don't stop seeing your friends. Don't stop going to a movie. Live your life because people who fixate on it do worse than people who live their life. And yet when you're in the hospital, you're in the most dangerous environment on the planet. And you need help. And we do not think of it that way. We think of patient navigation too often as an extra, as an add-on. When in fact, it is the essence of the medical profession to do no harm. And if you don't help people the moment they walk in the door, know everything that's going to happen, where and when and how it's going to be, then you're harming them because that anxiety affects their health. It raises their cortisol levels. It raises their stress levels. It raises their inflammation. So I didn't need any of my personal experiences to convince me of this, but man, having gone through them, I didn't know when my son was born about patient navigation. I didn't know when my dad was crazy in the hospital about patient navigation, but I knew I needed help. And I needed help from people who'd been there before. That's you. So we on the Cancer Initiative, um, we're small, we're seven people. We have a small budget, we're not handing out money, we're doing everything we can to invest in people. We have a terrific board, including, including Susan Schneider, who's 
just joined our board here in the back, um, of people who care about making the world safer for people with cancer and to eliminating the fear and dread of cancer and to, if not curing it, at least turning the deadly ones into chronic treatable ones and taking chronic ones like mine in the situation where I don't have to worry about it. And more importantly, my mother doesn't have to worry about it. She's 94 and she's on fewer medicines than I am. So she's the one who asks me all the time about my health. I don't ask her about her health because I know she's good. So I didn't even tell her I had leukemia until I needed treatment because there was a year in between. And I knew if I told her she would do what she's done since then, which is every day, because she lives here in town, every day, son, where are you? I'm in my office, mom. Are you taking care of your health? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, you better. I got it. It'd be nice if somebody did that to everybody in the hospital, right? But my mom is just one person. She can't do that for everybody. <laughs> so you can go to our website, bidencancer.org, find out a lot more about what we're doing. You already know what, about what Joe Biden and what he's doing. He's on a book tour, started yesterday, about the, his son. The book is called Promise Me Dad. Um, and uh, you'll see him on TV a lot. But just keep in mind, he wrote that book so people would understand what he went through so they wouldn't have to go through it. And that's what you all help people do every day, and I can't thank you enough. There's a lot of information I'd want to give you, but I can't give it to you in a short amount of time, and I'd bore you if I did. But please keep doing what you're doing. We're here to help you. We are anxious and eager and obsessed with helping you. At any policy level, whether it's federal reimbursement, whether it's fighting back against the changes in payment that are going from the right thing to the back to the wrong thing, and whether it's convincing hospitals and cancer centers that your mission is to help patients, not to make money. If you help patients, you will make money. If you only make money, you will not necessarily ever help patients. And we have got to drive that. There is no technical problem to any of the issues we're dealing with. Data standards, data sharing, clinical trial reform, patient navigation are all within our grasp. It's all about attitude and culture. And that's what we all have to band together to change. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Sounds like he was listening to us for the last day and a half. <laughs> you know, all sound familiar. You weren't listening. I, I, I was there in spirit. been reading the newspaper in the last 36 hours. Um, President Trump, as uh, Greg was mentioning, is trying to move away from value-based care to procedural care, if you will, driven by an orthopedist um, in a, an important political appointment at the moment. Um, a lot of what we've talked about in the last day and a half has been, you know, what would the drivers be? <coughs> Uh, to incentivize expanding navigator programs and better patient outcomes. And it's very hard for us to get around the fact that um, it has to be how we're reimbursed for what we do. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you're still here, but Ron Klein is here from CMS, and um, Wendy uh, Marinkovich from uh, Blue Cross Blue, Blue, Blue Shield Foundation. We've talked a lot about this. What are your thoughts about that? Well, the problem with our healthcare system, and that's a hell of an introductory statement, because where do I, you can go anywhere from there, is that for so long, health was only a cost. Um, it was not an asset because there was nothing you could buy. If you had a heart attack 50 years ago, there was nothing you could buy. You went home, you took aspirin six times a day until you could get out of bed and go back to work. And it was basically free. Now, a heart attack costs a couple hundred thousand dollars, and there's all kinds of things you can buy. So our healthcare system initially was designed around scarce resources to do anything for you. 
And so we paid people for doing whatever they could for you. Well, now the world has completely changed and we have all kinds of things we can do for you. The question is, which one helps? And how do we know if we don't have outcomes data that's, com that's compared? If we don't have hospital outcomes data that looks at how their recidivism rate and readmission rate, et cetera. So the healthcare story is really a success story that we've gone from nothing we can do for you to a lot we can do for you, but we're still using a payment system that relies on the old scarcity model. So we have to now, and by the way, an insurance system that was based on chronic illnesses like diabetes and um, heart failure, and that was based on relatively shorter lifespan and being able to, you know, just take uh, Lipitor the rest of your life is not equipped to deal with a world in which we have drugs that can cure you. It is not equipped to deal with success. So when we have a cure, and it costs a lot of money because it's going to literally save money the rest of your life, we have no way of figuring out how to pay for it that keeps people able to take it. So we have to change our assumptions about our healthcare system to match the reality of what's actually changed, which is we are entering the curative age, not just the palliative age. We now can cure things. My CLL is basically cured, knock on wood, said my doctor. Heart failure, we've had new drugs the first time in decades. Melanoma, new drugs, first time in decades. Multiple myeloma, ALL. We are making progress, but we have a system that has no idea how to pay for that and because it's not designed to pay for that. So we have to switch our thinking, switch what we're doing, and that's hard to do because of culture. So what we really have to focus on is to, I've always said it would be great if we could pay lawyers for outcomes and doctors for their time instead of the other way around, right? You wonder why people don't call the, why they don't call their doctor because their doctor doesn't get paid to answer that call. Where you call your lawyer, tick, 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 it's starting, right? Does that make any sense? If lawyers do something, pay them. If doctors spend time with you, pay them. Because doctors are the last people to know how you're doing after they give you a drug. You know, the first person to know, other than your spouse or your children, is your pharmacist. Because you go back and say, you know, I, my mom would say, I took that Lipitor and made my arm hurt. She didn't tell her doctor. She told her pharmacist. So we've got a long way to go to make all these things happen, but you guys are going to get us there. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Simon. Uh, uh, Raymond Saragiago, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Blytheville, Arkansas, right around the corner. Yes. Kirby Smith, I don't know if you know him, may have been the guilty party, I don't know. But, but <laughs> he's a partner of mine, by the way. Um, <laughs> I have a question about something that's right at the core of our infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, and that is our means of communication. So, so patients and caregivers tell us all the time that, that communication is a, is a major problem. It is probably one of the core inefficiencies of our healthcare system that drives our costs. The means of, of eliminating or minimizing the adversity brought by miscommunication are there. You know, the, 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 the knowledge, the, the communication infrastructure is there. Now we're moving to electronic health records and things like that, but these things, they don't speak to each other seamlessly. Right. What do you think? we can do in the next few years to transform this? Because the, the, the ability to transform it is there. Is it a lack of will? And will we overcome that lack of will or whatever else is? Possible? Great question. It is, a, it is the artifact of treating doctors like God and treating health differently from every other aspect of your life in the worst possible way. You use open table to get a restaurant reservation, and before dessert, they have surveyed you about how it went. My car tells me when it needs help. My body doesn't, at least in a way that I can detect it. The, the ability to communicate about every other part of your life, whether it's your finances, your bank, 
your school is all right here. It's all right here. What's not here are your medical records. What's not here are an easy way for you to know when you're supposed to get checked for colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, whatever it is, because we haven't set it up that way. It is so not hard to do, and it's all can be done right here. And there are, you know, thousands of small companies working on apps to do all kinds of things. But the question remains, why do we not know what's going on with the people that we're trying to help? So a friend of mine named Alexandra Drain started a company called ElizaCore. And they were one of the first to use an automated artificial intelligent call system to call people who had been identified as not adhering to their prescriptions, okay? Now, when we hear non-adherence, first, patients are usually insulted by that. And secondly, we think they're lazy, they're cheap, whatever. No. What they found was what she called the seven horribles. And this voice system was so good, people asked it out on dates, okay? <laughs> And they have over 100 million recorded conversations with people about why they're not on their drugs. They lost their wife. They lost their car. They lost their dog. They don't like their wife. They don't like their life. The reasons were not money or I'm a bad person. It was the rest of my life is in shambles. So I really didn't worry about filling my Lipitor prescription. And you know what they found? Some insurance companies in California, of course, found it cheaper to help them get a car loan, a divorce lawyer, uh, whatever it was that was the problem. It was cheaper to fix the problem and get them back on their meds than to ignore the problem and deal with them when they came back to the ER. They literally would help people with whatever the identified problem was, get it fixed so they could take care of their number one asset, which is their health. But we all know that people will, people are fragile. And if there's something that goes wrong, we like to think that we just power through it, but that's not the case. People are depressed. People are scared. People are whatever they are, but it's not that they're just lazy and they don't go to the drugstore. And that's, that was a hugely important thing. The other thing about communication is if we don't balance the power between the medical system and the patient so that the patient uses their voice because they know it will be heard, then we can't keep asking patients, well, why didn't you talk to your doctor about that? My own doctor, whom I liked a lot and I had seen for years, waited four days to tell me I had chronic lymphocytic leukemia after I had a physical. And he told me when I called him I called him after I was getting off a plane on the West Coast, and I thought, Lord of mercy, it's 4.30 in D.C., it's Thursday afternoon. If I don't call him now, I took the physical on Monday, I won't know till the next Monday because he doesn't work on Fridays. And so I called him and said, hey, how am I doing? He said, well, your PSA is good. I'm glad you called. Remember that. And he's glad I called. Your PSA is good because I'd had a few biopsies. Your cholesterol is good. I had been up to like 220 or something. But by the way, you have leukemia. I'm like, WTF, what does that mean? <laughs> by the way, I have leukemia. He said, you have 160,000 white cells. You better get that checked. No shit. <laughs> now, let me ask you, how, how long does it take to run a CBC? 15 minutes? Not even. When I go see my doctor, they run it. And then I wait 10 minutes, and then he has the results printed out. Now, there were lots of other things we were checking that took longer. Who cares? The first moment he saw 160,000 white cells, don't you think he would have called me? When I called my doctor I was going to see in San Francisco and told him this, he freaked out. You shouldn't have been on a plane. You could have had a blood clot, all kinds of things he was worried about because he didn't know what kind of leukemia I had. He didn't know if I had something that was acute, in which case I had a day, or chronic, in which case I had a little time. But speaking of communication, that's just nuts. Thank you, Mr. Simon. I really appreciated your um, words, and I can resonate with, with many of them. I, I'm not only a researcher, but I'm a three-time cancer survivor. 
and uh, both of my parents succumbed to cancer, so I, I totally understand. And, and I'm a navigator to a lot of my friends. But you mentioned communication, and many of us in the room are like me. We are on the research side. And so, you know, you ask about the app, right? All right, so I and my team, we, we have an idea for exactly the app you're talking about. And it would link to be able to talk to a navigator. Um, you know, you could, if it was bought by a health plan, they could look up how much out of pocket do I have to pay for that mammogram that I'm due for, et cetera. But my problem, and I won't say our problem, I'll just say our problem is we don't talk to those people who can make that real. I have no experience in apps. And when I go to talk to people, they say, okay, you need $100,000 or you need this. And it's like, I, you know, I don't have that money to do that. So I think it would be very helpful, perhaps, if you see, you know, your organization in the role of bringing those people yes. together to marry us. That's because, a great idea, actually. Because the, the... I just thought of that idea. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because we, we have the, you know, the idea of how to do this. We just don't know how to do it. Right. It's a classic case of the people who know the problem don't know the people who know the technical exactly solution. Exactly right. Yeah. So if you can link That's us, That's a terrific idea. And we, we do have a lot of connections. And as you can imagine, I hear from everybody who has a cure for cancer, a technology for this, a technology for that. I keep telling them, don't, you don't need to see me. If you have a cure for cancer, don't stop at my office. Go to the FDA because <laughs> I'm just a waste of time if you have the cure for cancer. But if you have an app to help patients and you need to know who would want to use it, and if you have a problem you think you can solve with the information you know how to give, we can help do that. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank Greg. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. That makes me feel good.